My name is Marty Leona, and I'd like to welcome you to this three-part webcast entitled Biomimetic Duravar Transcatheter Heart Valves, Studying the Clinical Impact of Restoring Native Flow. Let me introduce our panel. We're very fortunate to have Brian Lindman, who's the Director of Structural Heart and Associate Professor of Medicine at Vanderbilt University. Yoshi Kaneko, who's the Chief of Cardiac Surgery from Barnes Jewish um, Hospital and Professor of Surgery in Washington University. And Jeffrey Potma, who's a Professor of Medicine Emeritus at Harvard Medical School and the, and the Chief Scientific Officer at the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. Our goals are lofty in this three-part series. We're going to try to convince you that valve leaflets are king, and we don't pay enough attention to the importance of valve leaflet dynamics, anatomy, and function. Our goal is to evaluate transcatheter heart valve hemodynamics, valve performance, valve durability, including the implications of restoring laminar flow with TAVR. Our focus will be on Duravar, a balloon expandable, low frame height, new THV, that was designed to mimic the performance of a healthy aortic valve with a single piece of molded tissue. We're going to be discussing the Duravar THV, which is truly a new class of TAVR systems. This is a single piece of native-shaped biomimetic tissue that's designed and built to mimic the performance of a healthy aortic valve. There are several key features to this valve design as it's been integrated into a platform. There's an anti-calcification component that allows anti-fibrotic um, uh, uh, properties to the tissue and should prolong durability. There are long coaptation lengths for the leaflets, which should release and reduce stress. This is on a very precise balloon expandable platform. There's a, a, a commissural alignment feature, which is important. Uh, and the cell design is such that the upper cells are more open and allow free access to the coronary arteries. So the combination of all of these features with a particular emphasis on the valve leaflet material really characterizes this as a new version of a balloon expandable TAVR system. You know, when we think about it, it's really been an amazing 20 years. Marty, you were there at the beginning. I was there just after the beginning. When we started all this TAVR stuff, it was really for elderly patients who had no options. And I'll tell you, they were sick, much sicker than we're seeing today. And I think our focus at that time was really just on getting patients out of the lab and not having a stroke. It was pretty simple goals. But you know, we began to refine everything when we got to 2014 to 2019 because we began to do intermediate patients and low risk patients. And then we started to talk about longer term survival and ease of use and those other very important components. And you know, 2019 to 2025 has been a time of real growth and expansion of TAB. 100,000 in the United States this next year, over 100,000, that's pretty incredible. And now we think about rapid recovery and everything's about what the lifetime management is with long term. But I got to say, now that we're here, a lot of the discussion is really going to be about 20 and 25 and beyond and saying, OK, let's really focus on performance and let's get serious about durability. And that's going to be a package of, of a new valve. I mean, do we understand durability, Jeff, at this point? Well, I, I think we understand durability in a 75-year-old patient who has a life expectancy of 12 years and very low rates of structural valve deterioration over that period of time. I don't think we understand durability in the 65-year-old and with a TAVR valves. I mean, that's something from a surgical perspective that's been incredibly provocative on your side is that which is the most durable valve in the younger patient population? The surgical community has not done a great job. All the durability has been the risk for reoperation. Yeah. And I don't think we understood the valve durability well. And I think this is an opportunity. So Brian, tell us a little bit about, you know, what we should be looking at with valve performance and when to look at it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one thing that's gotten more attention recently is the fact that although aortic stenosis is ostensibly a, a valve disease, uh, it's, it's more complicated than that. And, and of course, uh, valve obstruction uh, yields uh, an impact on the ventricle pressure overload. Um, and we've started to recognize that more and understand more the role of hypertrophy and fibrosis and the irreversibility of some of those changes in terms of how they impact outcomes. But there are also aspects of the vasculature, and, and those are oftentimes, we don't pay attention to it. And uh, we, we had one study uh, from, from the partner trial that showed that after 
a successful TAVR valve was implanted, that, um, that vascular load, particularly pulsatile load, was associated with increased mortality uh, downstream after the procedure. So I think we also have a lot to consider and learn, frankly, about uh, unloading of the heart and the vasculature uh, downstream of the valve as well. So I think it's helpful to think about it, um, you know, as a, a valve, uh, as a ventricular, valvular, vascular uh, pathophysiology, and to appreciate some of those things. And, and, and as we're looking to fix aortic stenosis um, with a valve replacement and unload the heart, we need to appreciate those things. And, and that has an impact in terms of thinking about optimal timing of valve replacement, trying to make sure that the pressure overload doesn't create irreversible changes in the vasculature. And also in terms of thinking about uh, performance and maximal unloading or optimal unloading of the heart, both at the level of the valve, but also its impact on the vasculature insofar as LVH regression and the myocardium can, can recover and heal uh, after years of pressure overload. Yeah, these are very, very important concepts. Um, and Yoshi, I'm going to get your comments about what, how we measure some of these and get Marty to weigh in too. Is that, you know, we've always traditionally thought about bipartisan valve failure, and Marty was instrumental in putting together the VARC 3 guidelines, which very definitively defined categories of bipartisan valve failure. We've got structural valve deterioration and non structural valve deterioration with PPM and PVL. We have thrombosis, endocarditis. You know, are those enough? Is that what surgeons think about? And Marty, is this, now that we come think about VARC-4 someday when it comes around, are we gonna add in more sophisticated pieces as we talk about lymphosis? So, Yoshi, what about surgery? And then we'll ask Marty. You know, I think from the surgery side, we're very simple people. So it's either it failed or it didn't fail, right? So I think this is a grand advancement in the field. Um, but to answer your question, I recently did a TAVR explant and clearly one of the leaflet, it was only three years out, one of the leaflet was not moving at all. And it's very likely that the valve thrombosis led to that structural valve deterioration. So these are, these could be intertwined. And I think there could be some revisions to come in the future. What about flow, Marty? Yeah, I think that um, as the surgeons sometimes are overly simplistic, we get very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so we now have imposed a whole variety of imaging related factors and now physiology and flow factors to try to define um, valve performance, and uh, uh, which I think is a good thing, but we also have to be able to translate this into terms that people can understand, because we tend to talk over people's heads. Um, there's no question that um, uh, there are subtleties in terms of um, pathobiology of valves as they heal uh, and as they interact with their local environment. Um, that we just never appreciated. And now we're beginning to, I think, gain a greater understanding of some of those factors and some of the downstream effects of that. Uh, and the downstream effects are that we um, um, uh, acquire various degrees of cardiac damage when you have a pressure overloaded system, uh, even with relatively mild degrees of stenosis. And that accumulation is variable from patient to patient and the impact of that accumulation also has a, a, a clinical uh, concern that goes beyond the traditional understanding of this so-called long latency period in aortic stenosis. So at every step of the way, when you impose an extra pressure load, as you would with hypertension, in this case at the valve level, you have put you know, this organ at risk. And we need to recognize that if we're gonna optimally treat patients with aortic stenosis and and consider the disease to be more of a continuum over the course of decades, and not just a singular event that we intervene during an index procedure and all of a sudden our work is finished. So as physicians, I think we do need to understand more about the imaging, the physiology, the impact of those um, on underlying cardiac function, uh, and begin to intervene in different ways and think of it differently. And that's part of the purpose of looking at new technology that may have some advantages over what we've been previously told um, is the state of the art in terms of replacing a valve. And another thing that we need to learn more about is trying to figure out some of these imaging findings that we have, whether they be echo or CT, 4D CT. We see these things. It seems like, oh, maybe that's a problem, but sometimes they don't translate into clinical outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so trying to connect the dots as to what imaging findings 
are meaningful versus just, you know, sort of, okay, we see it, but it doesn't translate into stroke or downstream outcomes is also something I think we're learning about. You know, we focus so much on frames, short frames, tall frames, leaflet length. Um, we focus on treatment of the valve leaflets themselves, whether it be with AOA coating or whether it be with Resilia. We really haven't talked about flow as one of those components you know, as a, as, as, as a very important predictor at the end stage of not just the durability for anti-calcification, but whether or not there's actually the stress forces on the leaflets to develop degeneration. And I think flow is going to be very, very important. Um, Brian and Yoshi, can you speak a little bit about healthy flow versus non-healthy flow or turbulent flow? And maybe we can show an example here um, of that in terms of some of our imaging. Yeah, so let me tackle this first. Okay. So the healthy flow is supposed to be laminar. And what that means is when the blood goes through the vessels, because the blood is contacting the vessel itself, that part of the velocity decreases, right? And the center of the blood flow is the fastest because of that lack of resistance. And it becomes very universally sort of a flat curve mm -hmm. um, in terms of that flow, which creates this beautiful flow um, that is seen in this slide. When there is a turbulence, that, that flow is distorted. So, you know, because the flow is directed to one direction, one side of the resistant blood vessel resistance becomes much, much higher than the other. Therefore, the energy gets lost. So if you think about the energy loss with a blood flow, what that means is that the heart muscle has to create that energy in order to compensate, right? So it means that it has to work more, therefore puts more afterload and does not have that benefit of reducing you know, the disease process. And I think that's where we're gonna talk about the importance of, importance of the flow uh, with the laminar flow and the non-laminar flow or the turbulent flows. And this, this can have sort of a negative uh, spiral effect insofar as there's, you have more eccentricity, more helical flow coming out of the heart that can change the properties of the aorta itself and, and you know, make it more prone to inflammation and its composition uh, more fibrotic and then that can create a stiffer aorta. So these things have interplay with one another in a, in a negative direction. You know, we use these words by like laminar flow and trying to get, I mean, there's gotta be some imaging ways that we can, that we can look at this as well. So maybe you guys could kind of talk a little bit about what we can see and what's apparent to clinicians yeah. in terms of differences of flow with different valves. Right, and I think this slide is golden. I mean, even a surgeon can understand it. So it's very um, self-explanatory. But to the left, um, it shows the normal aortic flow. Um, the left upper one is the, um, the healthy aortic valve. And you can see that throughout the entire aortic valve orifice, you see the flow through it. That's what happens if you have a laminar flow. Post Duravar implant, you see the same picture. You see that the entire valve area opens up in that red color, meaning that there is a flow throughout. It doesn't happen in all the four pictures that you see on the right side. So patients with severe aortic stenosis in some of the other valves, both transcatheter valve and a surgical valve, does not create that laminar flow. And this is a very interesting slide. Again, it's still conceptual at this point. Uh, we, have to be, we have to be cognizant about that. The numbers that are assessed in this, in this slides are very small, but it does give you some hypothetical questions um, that we would want to know whether this really has an impact in the long term. But the things to remember are again that healthy flow is laminar, looks very nice on a picture, imposes very little um, uh, increased um, wall stress, um, and is friendly to the LV. Unhealthy flow is non-laminar. It's also called turbulent. You have increased shear stress, and it imposes significant strain on the LV, and that has implications. Um, so I think those principles uh, we've never really paid much attention to. But if we're really talking about durability in a young person who's going to be expected to outlive the normal um, uh, a bioprosthetic valve life, these issues are very important. And that's why we're refocusing in this new modern era of um, uh, transcatheter valve therapies uh, on trying to understand, measure, image, 
and translate how these new concepts are going to affect um, uh, clinical outcomes in the future. So, you know, it's interesting because Duravar has been designed specifically to enhance laminar flow by its construction of single leaflets. We'll see if that's going to be important under clinical trials. Um, balloon expandable, lower profile, longer leaflets, but lower profile. Um, I guess my question, Brian, is that are imagers going to understand this concept of laminar? They look at a lot of post AVR patients, they look at a lot of turbulence. Do you think they'll notice a difference when they're looking at a post Dervar patient? I mean, insofar as echo is the, the tool that we're most commonly looking at, I'm not really sure that that'll be appreciated, quite frankly. Uh, the extent to which, you know, MRI might be done afterwards, perhaps that's where you're going to pick it up and notice it. So I, I think it's something that, um, you know, it's a physiologic um, uh, phenomenon that, that, that we, we think may be important uh, uh, downstream to, to optimize ventricular reverse remodeling and clinical outcomes, but um, you know, it'd be time, an opportunity to see whether that actually you know, pans out in the context yeah. of clinical trials. Well, certainly it would translate into lower gradients and bigger UAs. I mean, that's, that's the minimum that we yeah. do if you don't see the flow yeah. differences. In this session, we've really tried to give you a better understanding of the importance of flow dynamics in aortic stenosis. Uh, we've talked about normal valves, we've talked about disease valves, we've talked about what we're currently using, which are surgical valve implants, largely bioprosthetic, and now transcatheter valve implants. And we're trying to suggest to you that uh, this is not all uh, a single genre, and that there are technology differences and subtleties that may become important in the future as we evaluate these therapeutic devices in terms of um, uh, not just early, but more importantly, long-term clinical outcomes. We've discussed that um, laminar flow is our ideal um, uh, uh, objective. It, it makes valves as normal as they can be and imposes the least stress uh, um, on an LV. And if we could replicate that flow pattern in a replaced valve, it is our impression that durability and other concomitant cardiac abnormalities are going to be reduced. Uh, and we think that uh, Duravar, um, among the new um, TAVR systems that we've seen, certainly has uh, you know, a chance of being a differentiating uh, platform from the standpoint of how it preserves normal flow dynamic. In our next session, we're going to talk a little bit more about these downstream and upstream of effects of flow patterns on TAVR, and then ultimately how that affects clinical outcomes.